So methods, methodology, research design, how do these words make you feel? What effective registers or emotions do you associate with this theme? Or from another angle, what feelings about method lie behind your decision to get involved in a conversation about methods in energy geography? Excitement, anguish, shame, terror? I want to speak today about being cheerful when it comes to methods. Now, cheer is not often an emotion associated with methodology or research design. It's an unusual association, perhaps. For certain, it's not been the way I've felt about method until recently. Yes, I've always appreciated methods are necessary, but they were, in my mind at least, if not those for reviewers or funders, of secondary significance to the conceptualization, to the framing, to the writing. That's where the excitement lay. It's fair to say that method has never been the thing that's got me out of bed in the morning. And if I'm honest, the way I used to feel about method was probably because I knew I was not very good at it. It's something that didn't come naturally, but in which others around me often excelled. So the word impractical was an adjective often aimed in my direction on many occasions. So why cheer? Why being cheerful and what's happened? Can method ever be cheerful? What I want to do in the time I've got is to suggest there are three reasons uh, to feel cheerful. I'm gonna lay them out and then I'm gonna briefly illustrate them with reference to two projects I'm working on at the moment. So I think the first reason to be cheerful is encompassed by this brilliant little adjective, tractable, meaning easy to handle, solvable, to make a problem tractable means crafting it in such a way that it can be addressed through research. Now, what this word signifies, I think, is an extension of the idea of research as a puzzle. Thinking of research as a puzzle provides some direction, a coherence, establishing what it is, what is it we want to find out? What don't we yet know? And methods play a substantial role here. They are the means by which you can make a general research problem tractable. So thinking about methods then is a way to go from your good and fascinating idea, an idea that perhaps runs around in your head as an aspiration, into a researchable project. And I think that's where the cheer comes in. It's a way of taking forward something that you're passionate about, being able to materialize a thought as a project. What the distinction here being a project is doing things in places with people. So thinking about methods then means moving from what and why to questions about how. It's the way you put your brilliant idea into practice. And I want to note straight away here that this how question can be much more open than at first one may think. So making something tractable is rarely about finding the one, the one true solution. Sure, you'll have your own repertoire, your own comfort zone of methods, but particularly if you plan to work with others, you don't need to be restricted to your own abilities uh, and methods frequently mean options. So that's why an event like this, which explores a range of methods in energy geographies is I think so useful. And the second reason to be cheerful is this captured I think by this word demonstrable, demonstrable, is that method, is, is that method allows you to show, to show and not just tell, to demonstrate something and not just claim. And it's through method that you can evidence something, make a claim demonstrable. So the world is full of claims, we know this, uh, uh, and claims about what is and what ought to be. There's no shortage of people able to make claims. So what distinguishes the kind of claims that academic researchers can make and the influence our work can have is the underpinning method. Now, sometimes this, this capacity of methods to demonstrate is described through the lens of rigor. Uh, rigor, for example, as I'm sure many people will know, is one of the three evaluation criteria for publications assessed for the research excellence framework in the UK, alongside originality and significance. But rigor, that word, is often wielded in unhelpful ways, comparing work as being more or less rigorous, for example. 
And instead, I think it's much more useful to actually unpack what rigor means, which is how do you demonstrate your claims? On what is your interpretation base, based? And that's where method is key. So a reason to be cheerful then is that this capacity of methods to demonstrate, to show, and by showing potentially to influence. I think this is particularly important for a wide range of issues um, associated with energy. So the third reason is that methods are ultimately, I would say, social. Whether it's the people you meet, so your research participants, the people who during the ethical review process you will call human subjects, uh, whether it's your colleagues and your fellow researchers who are collecting, creating or interpreting data with you, or whether it's the journal reviewers and the conference participants you are seeking to persuade, at some point methods are, have a fundamentally human element. It's about attributing meaning, navigating difference. So I think this is true generally, but it's particularly true when it comes to working interdisciplinarily. And much of the work geographers are doing on energy is either explicitly socio-technical in its framing or involves working with or engaging non-geographers. So there's always an inherent element, I would suggest, to what we do as geographers when working with energy that has this interdisciplinary component. And in that context, it's often method and not theory that's the glue that holds working relationships together. And I find this immensely cheering because at some level, we all know how to be human. We have experience, good and bad, of course, and we can reflect on it to help us in these social encounters around method. So let me briefly illustrate these three points, the tractable, the demonstrable, and the social character of method, methods with reference to two projects that I'm leading at the moment. So the first of these projects here on the screen is Fraying Ties, uh, Networks, Territory, and Transformation in the UK Oil Sector which is funded by UKRI and involves an interdisciplinary team. Specifically, it involves expertise from uh, economic geography, from international relations and political science, and from anthropology across three universities, Durham, the London School of Economics, and VU Amsterdam, um, and a research arts activist organization based in London called Platform. And it also involves the RGS IBG as a, as a project partner. So to put some names to this, at the LSE, we have Giza Weskelnis. Um, at VU Amsterdam, we have Nana de Graaf. Um, at Platform, we have James Marriott. And we've had three postdocs involved across the project. Um, Alex Dodge, uh, William Ocheri Darko, and Diego Tichiera. So the aims of the Fraying Tides project are to understand an ongoing transformation in the UK strategic position in global oil networks and to investigate the range and strength of ties between firms and territory. And what we're doing is we're examining transformation across three levels, changes in asset firm relationships, um, using global production networks as a framework. We're using social network analysis to examine elite networks in the oil sector. And we're using extended case studies to understand the evolution of practices and norms. And we use interviews. Um, these would be described, I think, as elite interviews in that they involve corporate people, government actors, and a range of technical experts. And we use a range of secondary data sources, sometimes combining and transforming existing data sets. Now, for quite a long time before I submitted the proposal, this was an idea in search of a method. The core of the idea was relational networks in an energy sector associated with a particular territory and in some kind of transformation. And I had lots of interesting discussions with really interesting people, but I didn't really have a way to take it forward as a piece of research. And to get this into something that would sustain meaningful research activity at scale, by which I mean would be fundable, would allow us to employ people in the team, would allow us to carry out research over several years, that required a methodology. And the key here, and it, it wasn't a key that came immediately, it, it was hard, hard fought to get to this point. The key was working out the three level structure, transformation at three interlinked levels, and then identifying methods appropriate for each of those, those levels. And from there, having the right people who really knew how to use um, those methods. And that's what we have in Fraying Ties, an interdisciplinary team 
looking at an energy sector problem that's made up of economic geographers, international relations and anthropology, and an experienced third sector organization with a history of work on oil and gas. And we're still doing the work. Um, here's a recent output from the project. Uh, this came out last month, uh, a paper by Alexander Dodge and myself, which comes from the work stream that's on these asset firm relationships as they relate to the North Sea oil and gas sector. It's framed by global production networks, and it's based on a combination and analysis of secondary data sets. There's more to come from this project. Uh, the social network analysis paper is coming forward, led by Nanar de Graaf. There's a paper on offshore licensing, led by Gisa Weskelnis. And there's another on valuation strategies in the offshore oil sector that's in the works and that draws on the interview material we've uh, interview um, materials we've been gathering over the last six to eight months. Further, the method here is allowing us to show how the oil sector in the North Sea has become a qualitatively different thing in the period since peak production about 20 years ago. We've been able to show, and that's what this paper is about, we're able to show how public equity, so firms that are listed on stock exchanges, where they're subject, for example, to climate related disclosure requirements, that those types of firms have decreased in significance. And at the same time, a range of private equity and state owned firms have become more significant. And the method, which involves combining two data sets to enable the calculation sorry, calculation of acreage shares in the North Sea has allowed us to put some numbers on that shift. And the interviews have allowed us to uh, understand some of the reasons and the rationales for why oil firms have left the North Sea, but at the same time, others have come in. A second project that I'm involved in um, is on the geopolitical economy of energy system transformation. And this project forms part of UKIRK's Theme 1 programme. Now, the Theme 1 programme is led by Mike Bradshaw. And as many of you may know, Mike's a longtime advocate for geographical work on energy. He's now Professor of Global Energy at Warwick Business School. I'm leading a part of this work, which is on the critical mineral supply chains, where we're using methods and approaches, again, from economic geography, global production networks, but also conventions theory, to understand the organization of these networks. And again, interviews feature prominently here um, amongst our methods. I've been doing this work with a postdoc, Erica Fagin, who was previously at Durham and is now in Vienna. And while both of us had done work on extractives, extractive industries using GPN approaches before, neither of us had worked on lithium or batteries. So going into this project, we needed a strategy that, allow, that would allow us to build some technical competence and understanding. And I think this is something a lot of us working on energy face, a kind of basic energy literacy. And this often centers on units. So with batteries, the work we're doing on lithium ion batteries, it centers on things like specific energy and specific power and other key port performance characteristics, as well as on battery chemistry. For example, knowing the differences between your LCOs, your LFPs and your MSCs. Um, NMCs, sorry, um, which are around different types of battery chemistry when it comes to lithium ion batteries. So in developing our interview strategy, we initially looked for people at the academic interface with industrial research and policy. We were seeking out a space where the, the cognitive difference uh, was less for where we were coming from and where those experienced um, uh, uh, participants were based. And those early conversations are really key. We made some mistakes. A basic one was perhaps thinking about lithium ion battery technology as being relatively new, being recent. It certainly was recent to us, but for many in the industry, it's actually quite a mature technology having been around for quite a while. It also helped us to learn about how to talk about batteries in a way that would help us approach others. Now, the preparation for these interviews, as with the oil project, involves ca thinking carefully about what an interview can do, focusing on its potential as a mode of engaging with the world. Um, so here's some outputs uh, from this uh, lithium ion battery work. Uh, the, the one towards the bottom uh, came out again last month um, in Energy Research and Social Science. And there's one of the graphics there, which is about a series of dynamics taking place in this lithium ion battery production network at the moment. 
So the justification for, for interviews involves thinking carefully about what an interview can do, focusing on its potential as a mode of engaging with the world. So the justification for choosing interviews as a method for data generation rests on this potential. So we found it quite productive to be explicit with ourselves about what that potential was. So in the context of our research, that potential of an interview hinges on dialogue. And dialogue here really means when it comes down to it, active listening and adjusting in the course of a dialogue to what's being said. Now that's hard. And I think it's actually harder than we often give it credit for. Um, so what that means in practice is setting up an interview in such a way that you can reduce other things that get in the way of active listening. So reducing the need to take notes, for example, so recording if you can. Um, we worked very hard, I have to say, in the context of the lithium project and the oil project to set up a situation where we were able to record those interviews so that we could do much more listening rather than note taking. Another classic uh, solution to this problem is tag teaming, having two of you in the interview setting so one can ask and one can think. And as a part of the preparation for the interviews, anticipating what we might hear from a respondent so that once we're in that setting, we're able to judge whether this was new information, something different to what we anticipated we might hear. Now, of course, these, these skills are actually ones of good conversation. They go beyond research. But doing that process of active listening requires some active consideration. What conditions are required for the potential of an interview to be realized? And we've found, or I've certainly found across these two projects, that much of the time spent on method is spent on precisely this, creating the conditions where it becomes possible to implement your methods and in the way you want to implement them. So in the oil project, for example, we spent a lot of time finding and developing pathways for access that would allow us to interview and to record during an interview. We spent quite a bit of time building our own understanding by researching the companies and the individuals, including the career histories of individuals. We look for ways to develop and describe what we were doing, finding a resonant language that communicated our social science objectives to technical experts and training ourselves at some level in how to ask questions. So two practical components of that, we developed um, uh, what we came to call a methodological cookbook uh, for different work streams in the project. And what that did was unpack and extend elements of the method that we laid out in the proposal. This was a way, the cookbook was a way of sharing the desired outcomes from our method and an agreed how-to approach within the team. The second thing we did was we developed uh, what we probably rather grandly called a methodological protocol which is really a shared agreement about how data would be collected and used and by whom. And like the cookbook, the protocol is a way of thinking about the social character of implementing research, a way of establishing expectations about the approach, about data handling, while also providing some reassurance to the people who we were interviewing. So in sum, I think method can be cheerful, and dare I say it, it can even be a source of joy. And I say that as someone who has not always experienced methods in this way, and who I acknowledge uses method, uses a rather limited toolkit. But it's increasingly clear to me that questions of method are central to what we can do as energy geographers. Through method, we can translate interesting ideas into practice. We can bring evidence to the table along with our ideas, and so increase our capacity to persuade. And finally, method frequently involves substantive issues of purpose, communication, and a search for meaning that require dialogue, exchange, and negotiating difference. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the workshop. Let's welcome Dr. Huang for his keynote. Please. Okay, uh, can you see? Yeah, I can see it. Is it in the full screen or just? Uh, uh, no, not the full screen. Let me see how to do that. Sorry about all the Chinese. Uh, in the middle, in the middle. I think uh, I know. Yeah. But, uh, full screen. So left one. 
It should be like.、Uh, sorry about that. 幻灯片放映从头开始。Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hey, thanks, brother. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Just.、Uh... Oh God. I cannot touch my mouse. I think. Okay, I just leave it like that. It's just so terrible about this technical stuff. So you can still see, it, right? So I think that's fine. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the invitation to, uh, uh, for me to give this talk about qualitative methods. Uh, uh, my name is Peng Huang. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at Urban Institute at the University of Sheffield. Uh, to be honest, I'm not a scholar in the field of energy geography, but I'm more more of a you know transition scholar. But my work、uh, has largely, you know, looking into、uh, renewable energy innovation and the transition of、uh, the, you know, at the urban level and the regional level. So to some extent, I my work go across many literature on in energy geography. So today I will briefly talk about the pretty much just my own experience about using the cultivated matter in my own research because I'm sure that you have. You know, heard many other many other this kind of methodology workshop somewhere at university or you know other kind of workshop. So, to my understanding, in terms of、uh, the most important things of qualitative matter, I believe it's more like a, a very subjective understanding about the way you collect the document and the way you conduct the interview. Like Gavin just、uh, talked about. That、uh, in the end,、uh, the the quality matter is 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 pretty much social. So I haven't reached to that point that I can find this quality per se. You know, this matter per se is cheerful. But I would have to say, using this quality matter, particularly interview, is quite 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 cheerful. You know, the way to interact with people, the way you learn new knowledge. You know, to get into different group of people, that's kind of like a really cheerful process that I really enjoy. So I think since like 2015, after my PhD, a majority of my work、uh, using this quality matter. So I think there are some you know experience I can share with you. So in I would just、uh, you know there's kind of like a two part of my talk. One part is more generally talk about. You know how to start qualitative research and what kind of matter, basic matter I use in in my own work, and then、uh, which leads to the、uh, the second part of my work. So I want to talk a little bit about、uh, my experience about conducting this、uh, you know qualitative matter, applying this matter in the Chinese context, which I would have to say is quite different、uh, from the West. It's not only about China. I think it's more about more. Broadly, they have also broadly about the East Asia and the Southeast Asia. They have a kind of like confusion base of the you know so social network that really shape the way you do the you know research design and the conduct the interview. So I would like to give you a kind of like there are two part and uh, uh, the first part we just、uh, quickly go through that because I think it's quite general. So I think to start qualitative research.、Uh, Most of my research will start from the document analysis,、uh, which generally there include like three step. Like first, you need to have identify your research objective, which leads to the identification of different kind of sources and different kind of keywords you're going to use, etc., etc., to go to do the document searching online or in the library. So that lead to the second step, which is to process the material and document you have, including you try to build up a database, trying to code all kinds of material you have, trying to organize different kinds of material. For example, the newspaper, the literature, the academic literature, and also many kind of like the news report from social media, which nowadays seems to be really important to tell a good story. And、uh, the last step will be to conduct an evaluation of the document you have, for example, to identify the characteristic, the pattern, and the different phase of the story. So here I will just show you the the、uh, the kind of like two two example of the work I have done in the past year、uh, to to build up a, a database. 
So the figure on the left is uh, is uh, is a work I did for to 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 do analysis of the solar PV innovation and the, the industrial development in in China based on the technology innovation system framework. So you can see that based on the the framework, you will do the coding based you know do the coding like I'm not going you know really in detail because this is a framework that you might not be familiar might not be familiar with so basically you can see it's just a year like uh, the reference which is really important i would have to say because in the end if you have one thousand more than thousand uh material it will be really important that you have a good reference system that enable you to find the original reference when you need it so i think that's the part that is really important and you will have a brief introduction uh description about the event the material you have and then we're trying to categorize this into different kinds of a category, which will help you and really dependent on the framework you use. Uh, so that's kind of like a, give you a really very uh, initial idea about how I build the database. And the, the, the figure on the right is about the policy reviews of ecological civilization in China that try to identify different kinds of policy at different levels of government and when they publish and uh, which administration publish it, which make a large a, a lot of difference, and you can draw out the keyword from the policy, which will be really useful when you try to conduct the analysis uh, in the second in in the later stage. So, what does this document use? What what what? Why do we try to collect as many documents possible? The in the end, the the objective is about to tell a story. And uh, I, I completely echo, you know, Gavin's point about uh, what, is, what is the most important thing to, about doing a qualitative research, which is, uh, uh, to my understanding, which is to tell a good story. It's not just about methodology. It's not about, it's not even about the, the theoretical contribution you made, but it's more about tell a good story that you can convince the audience that this is the story, this is the logic behind the issue you're looking into. So I think as the people that love doing qualitative research, I think the, the most beauty thing, most, you know, the beauty of the qualitative research will be the story uh, per se, rather than the matter or the theory you use. So this is kind of like a, 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 another example about you know, one of the research I conduct about looking into the, the role of uh, verticality of policy make and how, how does this uh, policy make shape the development of uh, solar water heating in the provincial, in the Shandong province. It's a, it's a, it's a, provin it's a province in China that uh, you can look into how this policy makes shape the uh, industrial development and, and, uh, and in the end, how does this local development of uh, industry in the end you know, reshape you know, the policy makes on the central government. So that's kind of the story that depends on your framework. And this is the one, you know, using the framework of policy makes, but you can see that the essence of the story is about the, I, I would have to say it's about the phase you identify it and uh, what is the most interesting thing in different phase of the story. I think that make the story uh, most interesting. And that's the, how you attract the audience to believe the story you tell. So except for document, uh, the second hand material, the document we collected, what is the second important thing to tell a good story, which is Gavin also mentioned, which we we'll all know is interview, which is kind of like the most important thing in qualitative matter. And also I would have to say, it's the most cheerful thing in, in conducting and in applying this kind of qualitative matter. And in general, there are three types of it. There's an structural interview, the semi-structural interview, and the structural interview. I think you, you might be familiar with that, but in, normally we use a lot on this semi-structural interview because it's really flexible. It enable you to have, a, have a, you know, a specific topic to look into, but also give you the flexibility to ask the question and uh, to reflect on the, the, the issue you're looking into. But I would have to say, I, I just start to try, you know, I, I, I have a you know, 
write many papers based on this semi-structured interview. But now they also start to do this unstructured interview, which also make me really, you know, exciting about because that's something that you might be able to find something brand new that you haven't thought about before. Because for semi-structured interview, at least you need to have some certain, at least a few specific question. So you have an, a, an outline of interview, you know, question for the interviewee. But for unstructured interview, pretty much you just have a really, you know, vague question. And you just, if you have the ability to, to, to reach the interviewee, you can just have a very loosely uh, discussion and talk with him or her. And then you will get some really exciting, you know, uh, I was, I was, I have to say, it's really insightful. So I really encourage you to at least do that, you know, once in a while, you know, with the interviewee, you can reach out. And uh, I would have to say, it's really rewarded in a way. So uh, I will just mainly talk about the semi, you know, structure interview here. And it's really general. It's really general that uh, it's also includes, generally includes three steps. First, you need to have uh, prepare the interview guide include topic, the question, and the target group, which is really important. And the second stage will, do, will be that you need to try to identify the participant and try to have your own strategy about sampling. And then lead to the last step, which is to truly conduct the interview and start to do the data processing. And there are three key points I want to make here that uh, just my own, it's based on my own, experience that I believe that there are three key points you need to keep in mind when you try to apply this qualitative matter, particularly interview, which is the first thing is uh, the statistical representativeness is not the goal of qualitative research, which seems to be obvious, but uh, in some way, when you try to conduct the research, when you try to do the writing, you always try to generalize something based on the interview, but when it comes back to you, you will see that that is not pretty much the, 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 the original goal of this research. Because for many you research based on quality matter, particularly interview, you're trying to find a good story, the typical thing, the typical issue that represent in the, you know, in the group of people you are looking into, rather than to find a general you know, uh, a conclusion that can apply to any other places. So that's the key point that I, you know, based on my own research, I, you know, I do believe that something is really important. The second point is uh, people always ask that how many interview I need to do. Uh, but to be honest, there's no requirements uh, for, you know, the number of interview, even though in the, in the paper published, you, you generally see that people conduct like 20, 30 or 40, a little less than 50. Uh, interview, and then they will make a paper, make a good story in the end. But uh, I would have to say it's not about the number of, in, of interview. It's more about when you will not find new information uh, on the ground from the interviewee. And normally, I would have to say when you have a very specific question, this kind of uh, you know, information will reach to a certain level that you are satisfied with when you have around 20, 30 interviewee, if you find the right interviewee, I think that's generally why that we see paper out there conduct around 20 or 30s. So the last point I want to make is uh, conducting interview. Gavin also you know, pointing out that conducting interview is why is it cheerful? Because it's really interactive learning process. And you might change not, not, not radically change, I would have to say, but to, in many cases, it will change your original question and the original focus because after conducting a couple of interviews, you will find that the most interesting question is not the one you set up in the very beginning. So that's a really interesting and cheerful process that you find out that, you know, something's more interesting than you, than you expected. So that's kind of like a three key points I, do, I want to make in general about the about conducting, you know, the semi-structural interview about, you know, applying qualitative matter on the ground in your own research. 
And then which lead to the second part of this talk is uh, I want to, because many of my work uh, is about China and uh, doing this field work and conducting, applying this matter in the Chinese context. And that's something I find, which I believe is really important. And uh, so that's why I think it's necessary to talk a bit about, talk a bit more about this here. That in China, I think there's a key word for conducting interview, which is corrective.ness And I would have to say it's not only about China and uh, it have a broader implication about conducting interview in East Asia, like Japan and Korea, South Korea, and also Southeast Asia, which they have this Confucian social network base that will change, will shape you know, people's relationship, which also shape the way you design the research for this kind of context. So uh, you know, uh, I, the, my colleague and I have published a few papers you know, about this corrective, about this corrativeness, and how does it mean for conducting transition study, for doing transition study on the ground in China? So what, what do I mean by, by corrativeness? Which you can see the, when, you, when you read this comparison about rela relationality and the corrativeness, I think you will have an initial sense about what does it mean here? Because in China, you know, Chinese philosophy does not completely follow the paradigm of causality. I would have to say. And all the relation, what we see in Chinese, we call guan xi, is predetermined and pre-existing. So that's why the logic of actual activity cannot escape this kind of operation of guan xi, which is which this kind of network is pre-existing. It's not something new. So that's why you can see on the on the right hand the, the figure to show the different kinds of social network. Uh, different social network uh, uh, compared to Chinese and the, the West. It's not like very precise, but in general, I think that's a way, uh, this two, it's the two way of uh, looking into the, 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 the structure of the society. And then what does it mean? You know, what does this kind of corrativeness mean or, or, or change the way we design the, 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 the cult of the matter, design the Qualitative, uh, you know, if we use this kind of different qualitative matter in Chinese context or broadly in Southeast Asia and South uh, and the East Asia, because that shape the way you identify your participant, you identify the most important actor in your story, and you can see on the right figure uh, that the way the Guanxi network in China. They organize as the uh, you know first circle, second circle, and the third circle, and this kind of way. So if you want to identify the the the, the causality of uh, you know certain issue, you have to identify the key individual or the key actor, and uh, try to go through the different circle around them, so you can identify the most important actor or individual that shape their logic of doing things. So that's pretty much because uh, uh, I don't have more time here. So I would just briefly introduce about you know you know the 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 way that uh, the experience that I conduct interview in China and I I believe this kind of uh, the if you can take a look at Chinese society in this uh, I would say alternative way I think you will have a more in depth understanding about what happened in China and why. So yeah, so that's, uh, I will stop right here. And uh, thanks again for the invitation and I look forward for the, for the coming workshop. Uh, thank you, Dr. Huang for your wonderful keynote. Uh, next, uh, let's let us uh, move to a very short Q&A session. Uh, time is limited, so we can have one or two questions. Um, uh, hi, uh, Professor Bridge and uh, Dr. Wang. Uh, may I ask the question, the possible ways to reach out to the interviewees? And I think maybe it is difficult to write, reach out to a high rank person that you don't know previously. Also, is, it, is there some difference in reaching out to the interviewees in uh, Western and Asian cultures? Thank you. Uh, 
Um, shall I just say a, a, a few a few words and then you, you can follow on, uh, Ping? Is that all right? Okay. Um, yeah, I think a lot. A lot. Thank you for the question. It's a very uh, very live live question. Anyone who's trying to set up interviews and reach uh, respondents participants knows this really well. The difficulty of often approaching people. It okay. sounded from your question as if you are wanting to approach people who are in hierarchies and you're looking to approach people relatively high up in a hierarchy um uh, and uh, th that's familiar to certainly for the work we've done on oil and one way one way we were able to approach this so the short answer will be a, a, a key thing is to understand the sort of networks you're you're trying to approach how are they organized so some of the the things that we just heard uh from from dr Tuang about uh this the cultural context and organizational structures is really important to understand in the in the um sector that i've been looking at where we wanted to approach people who are relatively high up exploration vice presidents that sort of thing a cold approach typically wouldn't work so a technique that we had found the sort of two two things we found to be relatively um useful one is something you might think of quite obviously which is to follow any connections you have so i'm based at durham there's a durham energy institute some of the people in the energy institute have links to industry so where possible we tried to pull on those threads um, they were very helpful in the end it didn't materialize many interviews that way what we found more useful was to identify where people we wanted to approach had been in a semi-public forum so they'd been at industry events so the oil industry has various events where people get together and give talks they sit on various panels that's kind of inwardly focusing but you can find out when they appeared on a panel in some sense even just from the title of what they wrote about or talked about we were able then to write to them with a quite a specific um, piece in the, the the approach saying we'd seen that they had presented at this we were interested in their arguments about x to try and make it clear that this wasn't a general approach but was actually about something they had said or their particular expertise so really it was about tactic effectively to try just get their eyeball time initially on the email these are really busy people they probably get a thousand emails they'll probably just ignore them normally so to get something specific they would at least get past the initial are they going to reply or not and then from there we could start to build a relationship if we got a response um, as we went into it one final thing and i'll stop as we went into it and have been able to secure some interviews we then found it was useful to say without giving any names away but say we have been able to talk to sit people in some of your other you know competitor industries or other firms in your position to give a sense that other people were talking to us um, and that we were keen to hear their side of the story um, but obviously you can't do that unless you've already got some underway but we had to work quite hard initially to to get things going to get the ball rolling Yeah, I'll just make a short uh, response to, to the question. I think, yeah, I think it's really much depends on the, the cultural context and the, the, the way, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the social network work in that country. Uh, so that's, and the, what Gavin said, I think uh, what Gavin just said, I think apply to, in general, many of the context, I would have to say, that's kind of like a two way you can try first, but it, it both way doesn't work. I think sometimes it, it, it really didn't work. And uh, I think that's why I said in the end, you might need to uh, try to adapt your research question uh, to some extent, because that's the people, that's the group of people you cannot reach. And the, if you cannot reach them, there's some, you know, something you will never know. Uh, so I think that's kind of like, a, in the end, you, you kind of like have to do that. But there's kind of like third way in the Chinese context, I think it's easier to contact, uh, you know, the high tier, you know, uh, governance uh, or, you know, this uh, CEO when they retired. So if you, you, you manage to reach out to, you know, the same company or the same, you know, an administration, uh, the official, the, the former of official of this administration or, you know, this company, I think they are easy, you know, easier to, to reach out. That's my own experience. And they know a lot. And in some way, they might be able to, you know, link you to the, to the people, you know, who, are, who is still, you know, in charge of the company, of the ministry. 
that's the third method I think you can try. Hope I hope it's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Bridget and Dr. Fong. Uh, please, I said. Uh, thank you. My question is to Gavin. From the very onset, is there a distinction between methods to acquire data and methods to analyze data? So when beginning a research, are you already thinking about two different methods or you're looking for a symmetry that can help you like a same method that you can use to do research and to do, analyze data? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, I'm just just trying to ref reflect on it because because uh, I, I find the reason I'm reflecting on it is I find myself often when I'm talking to colleagues about what phase we're at in something, I will make a distinction like you've made between collecting or generating um, and analyzing, and I'm. I find that useful because it, the because often we tend to focus on the collecting or the generating. How am I going to find stuff out? And the the analysis side of it tends to get a little shrunk in the description of it. So keeping it separate sort of forces us to think about what steps. How will I go from what I've collected to my interpretations, and to be quite specific about the steps one's taking. That's why I find it useful to separate them out. But I think in terms of conceptualizing particular projects, I talked about. I think what we knew we were interested in is interactions along a network. So the acquisition of a license, for example, for the offshore um, or the relationship between an offshore operator and um, the regula regulator, the regulatory authority. We want to know, so we need, we want access to both parts of this relationship and to understand what that relationship looks like from either end. Um, so we knew from the outset that we needed to um, have access to those two points and we did know how we wanted to analyze it we wanted to come to some conclusions about how this relationship was viewed what it was structured around and maybe something about change as well how that had changed over a period of time um, it wasn't obvious to us that at the outset that we would use something like in vivo for that uh, but we have found in vivo to be very useful for working through the range of material we've got. Um, so I think from the outset, we had an idea of them being linked together, but actually separating them out was quite helpful as a breaking up the process to be clear to oneself about where you are in a process and what it is you're doing. And to make sure I've this just speaking personally, can't speak for my colleagues, but personally, I find it really helpful to be clear where I am in a process to make sure that I'm not inadvertently skipping too quickly over something to be quite conscious about the steps I'm taking, particularly around the analysis phase, so that when it comes to write up and explaining your results, you can explain what you did at various points in order to come to a conclusion about strategy in the offshore oil sector, for example. Thank you. Uh, thanks again to Gavin and Ping for giving the keynote. Uh, also, thanks to the participants for the great questions.